So my questions, I got a few of them actually. Uh, one is singing in the mask and cry mode. I haven't heard you talk much about that. How important do you think those are? Cry mode, what do you mean by that? Well, I got that from just a couple other YouTube guys. So like when you're in cry mode, it's like um, you're, I don't know, you, you, you put your palate like you would if you're crying. So uh, I think Phil Mafarage talks about that a bit. He doesn't call yeah, it cry yeah. mode, but. Well, you need, so some people call it, uh, I can answer, what's the first part of your question? Singing mask, in the mask. mask. Um, I mean, I guess the best thing the way of explaining that, at least from my perspective, is is if it's lacking, it, it needs to be fixed. Um, so if someone's not quote unquote in the mask, what what are we hearing? We're basically hearing a kind of muddy quality to the sound, i.e. the the sound has lost the the kind of overtones around like three k that type of area. So. Like if I'm doing an exercise with a muddy sound, like a boo 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 boo, if it gets too muddy, boo 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 boo, boo it loses uh. So if I have a, a balanced on the boo boo, uh, boo 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 boo, you can still hear uh in there a little bit. But if it gets too dark, it kind of drops out of the mask, and you're going to hear muddiness, and you, you're going to have that three k. Those three k overtones are going to just be, get scooped out, basically. So. If somebody is leaning too much towards darkness and muddiness, just broadly speaking, like they need to kind of get the sound, mm -mm, get it forward and get used to having that buzz in the sound all the time. Um, if they're not doing that as a habit, then it's something they don't need to think about too much. So, and, and how do they not do that? Well, they have to kind of make a choice. Some people end up doing this because they start studying technique and they, especially with SLS, unfortunately, is some of the examples get really muddy, which is, you know, the, the chords are thinning out, you're getting to head, but you're never gonna sing in that muddy quality. So then they have to find, well, okay, how do I get from this is kind of sound, I'm never gonna sing here, there's nothing in the mask, back to here. Where you can hear uh in the tone. So as long as, I, I mean, as long as you've got that split of resonance and it's not, getting cut out in terms of that 3k now how much of that you want you know is is somewhat subjective in terms of some people lean on that more than others but ultimately you just want to have some of that that brightness in the sound all the time now if you've got that if you've got that already like i'm not gonna have to work with it with you on it because it's not something i'm going to notice if it's there if you're singing on muddy qualities and you're exercising on muddy qualities i'll be like yeah okay stop stop exercising here and start exercising with a split um and that would be like when we would focus on that sum but for most people that's not so much of an issue um i don't think we've spoke about that before because it's not something that you do particularly much yeah okay good and then another question about uh like narrowing vowels i've heard you talk oh. about how Maybe Let me finish. What was the second part of your question, though? The first the last one was one. Singing, the singing in the mask last. and the cry mode. Yeah, so cry. You could explain this in different ways. So when Brett Manning talks about tilt, or some people call it pressing in, some people call it cry. As we go up higher, we have to find a way to, some people call it dampening the sound. But basically, as we go up higher, we've got to consistently feel pressure coming off the voice. So we're not yelling. And the way we do that is we add some of this kind of crying quality. Uh, as I go up, if I have ma 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 ma, I'm going to start yelling. Unless ma 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 ma, uh, 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 I'm adding this in a little bit of this as I go up higher. So we add more cry to maintain the pressure coming off the voice and keeping it what I would call flat. As in, I don't feel like uh, I feel like I'm on top still. Okay. So. so being in cry mode, I mean, it's it's not a term I've heard, but I, I would say we all need to have some of that kind of quality here. Like if I talk to you with a little bit of cry and exaggerate it, it would sound like this. But that cry needs to come in as we go into head voice or we're not really in head voice if there's not enough cry. OK, so below middle C, you don't really use it, would you say? A little but yeah, not much. Okay. As I get as I get into mid, like around middle C, especially for your voice type, that's when you're going to start to have a little bit correct starting to come in. 
the transition to the head. I mean, I, I really feel it from the bottom upwards, but you're right in the sense that it doesn't really start to happen much until we get to just around middle C area. Some guys a little bit higher, some guys a little bit lower. But yeah, that's when it starts to feel it. Okay, that makes sense. And then for narrowing vowels, I heard on some of your YouTube, you were talking about keeping the vowel narrow. And what strategies do you use to do that? You were mentioning something maybe, but you're doing it in the back of your throat somehow. Is that right? Uh when we do the exercises and we talk about keeping the vowel pure, like if I'm doing this, like a oh, if I understand oh, then it's staying narrow. If it's not staying narrow, we start to hear, oh, we start to feel that or feel that quality start to come in. So it's it's difficult to say like do this with your throat. Whilst there are small things we're having to do as we stay narrow. Like, I can't really tell you in a sense because it's just too, it's too like detailed in here what needs to happen for me to kind of say, oh, well, just feel this and then you'll be able to stay narrow. Like, yes, that's kind of true. But when you don't know how to stay narrow, like no amount of me telling you what to do is going to get you narrow. Hence why we just say, okay, keep it here. Ooh. Ooh. Then you learn how to stay narrow without having to think well how do i do this you just right. keep that vowel pure and when you feel oh, you know you're not narrow anymore now making that comparison is what shows you okay this is what narrowness feels like and this is what widening feels like but unless you've got that comparison with the technique you're never going to know i can't tell you any other way this is the issue with explaining technique ultimately is that it's impossible because my reality my vocal reality <laughs> is different to your vocal reality Right. And if I explain anything to you, you'll filter it through what your your world and you will butcher it. <laughs> I don't mean that everyone will, even if you even people that are better singers than me will will butcher some of the translation, not necessarily in a bad way. It could be in a positive way, as in this that they, they I will explain something. They'll be able to demonstrate it better than I can because their technique is just innately better, or they they've worked in it longer, they did it, started younger. But um my point being is if you do it and you can say, okay, that's getting wide and that's staying narrow, that gives you a chance to say like, ah, oh, okay, it, what felt different there? And then you can okay. say, okay, this is what staying narrow feels like. That's a direct understanding. Language is an indirect Chinese whispers type thing, which is why it's so bad at explaining this stuff. Doing it, it. and having a comparison is ultimately what's going to show you in reality. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. My next question, I don't know if this one makes even makes sense, but um, when you're dealing with chord closure and volume, does it matter how much chord closure you have when you're increasing or decreasing volume? Are they related or it just depends? Yeah, I mean, as you connect more the vocal cords, you need more pressure underneath to get them to vibrate, which some people call support. Traditionally, it would be called support. We're trying to balance out how tightly we connect those cords with the appropriate pressure underneath. If we connect the cords too tightly, even if we push enough air through that the sound starts to go a bit harsh, if we connect the cords not enough, we can keep pushing air, but it's not really going to build the sound much. So we've got to get just the right amount of grip on those vocal cords as they connect with the right pressure underneath. And basically it's like a balancing act. As we get better, what happens is this is, when I'm singing quietly, the pressure comes down, the, the closure comes down. And as I bring up the volume, I connect the chords more and I put a little more press on there. But this is quite a subtle adjustment. The best thing to learn at first is just some type of centigram where we kind of figure out like, okay, like this is what it feels like to just stay roughly in balance. Um, I think one of the issues with my own coaching um, over the years has been that I've kind of dragged people sometimes a bit too quickly into the idea of adjusting closure because in all honesty, it's something that is is something that we start doing like once we've got good fundamentals. Um, if the fundamentals are weak, it can kind of make people in a sense start, you know, messing with things that are just going to end up breaking their voice more than fixing it. So we've got to search for as much balance as possible before we start 
leaning in and out and trying to get in the center too much. Not to say we can't do it, but the best thing is just to find some balance and work from there. But the squeeze, I mean, I found even this year, like as I'm squeezing into mix, I'm having to be a little bit more careful than I used to be because I used to over squeeze on it. So it's hard to get the, the que- answering the question of how much squeeze is enough is a challenge. Uh, I don't think there's a like completely right and wrong, but there's definitely a little gray area where if you get past that, it's going to start sounding a little bit harsh, a little bit just too heavy, even though it can be kind of correct and vice versa. If we can't lean in enough, it will, we're never going to be able to generate volume, you push air through and it's just going to sound heady. Okay. Now, um, this is, if I'm thinking of chord closure, if you look at my hands, like if you're doing a hootie, like this really light, you'd be doing like this and then medium and then full closure would be that. Is that a correct yeah, analogy? Yeah, I feel like ee, 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 ee. the chords connect kind of gently. Na, na, na. Kind of somewhere in the middle. Ga, ga, ga. More fully connected. Okay. And the better we get, the more that just kind of becomes more of a gray spectrum. Um, most important one at first is just finding something that's not too much, not too little. Na, 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 Something like okay. that where we've got some connection right the way through the scales. And the reason that okay. is, is because it's harder for the arytenoids to grip a little bit than it is for them to really tighten up hard or let go a lot for most people. Um, yeah. I.e. because people have crude adjustment with these muscles typically when they start, um, <laughs> They can either do nothing with them or they like grab onto them for dear life. So when we try and look for the center, we're looking for the muscles to work in quite a nuanced way where, you know, it's, it's like, it's like this, it's like doing that with your hand open and closed versus when we're in the the middle, we're kind of doing this. We're kind of flexing right here. You know, when you're a baby, you're like, "Uh, uh," whereas as you get better, you can, you know, you get a lot more nuance in this motion. So this Got here it. in the center is what we're looking for when we look for medium compression. Really trains the muscles to to start working in the way they were designed rather than in a crude way. Okay. If you are squeezing just like this for a light squeeze, can you have just that much closer and still squeeze too hard? Or does the more does too hard come when you're bringing more of this or the whole cord in. Well, if you squeeze more from there, if I have e, if I squeeze more from there, e, 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 it's going to immediately start going towards more medium compression. So you can blow more air on that tone, e, but at a certain point, it's not going to be able to get much more volume because the cords aren't connecting with much pressure underneath them. So uh, if we connect the cords more from that hoot, there's no way to avoid getting into not that hoot, if that makes sense. So like if I have this sound, if I have e, 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 some people as they get to the bridge, you start to hear this, you hear e, 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 e. Now what's happening at the top? Really, I've got, uh, uh, I've got more grip, more connection coming in. Whereas if I was not adding that grip, e, 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 you never hear, uh, uh, you never hear that arytenoid grip coming in. So as we get better at this, what you really start to notice as you go through your range is you start to be able to understand like there's, if I have e, you hear pure hoot all the way through there. Now most people, if they try and get through that bridge on pure hoot at first, they often have e, you hear, uh, uh, you hear uh, coming in, which is the original is starting to grip in the mid range. Whereas if you get pure hoot, ee, there's no arytenoid, extra arytenoid grip coming in. So, and the reason that's key is because as we go through the bridge, we have to understand that what are we doing? We're stretching the chords. We are changing the connection of the vocal chords. Ideally, when we're just doing pure, t- talking about pure technique and isolating the stretch, when we hear that arytenoid squeeze as we go through the mid range, we're not really isolating stretch. We are stretching, but we're also starting to employ more arytenoid grip as we go through, which is the antithesis of good technique, at least when we work at this dry stuff, because what we're trying to do, we're trying to isolate the two muscle groups, the stretch and the connection. 
and we get we get more and more independence, the more we can adjust one more muscle group without moving the other muscle group. Got it. Okay. Um, when you are going from a, a light squeeze to more of a squeeze like that, the, what what do you feel in your throat? For me, if I'm adding more, I feel like I'm going a little bit lower in my throat to make that happen. Do you feel? Is that what you feel as well? A little bit. I mean, if I, e, 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 e. I feel it like this. If I was in talking range, if I have uh, 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 and then have uh, 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 all I really feel, it just feels to me like a little bit more pinch. This is the best way I can explain it. I feel like I'm doing the same thing, but I'm pinching on it just a little bit more in the throat. So you, you can experience that yourself. If you connect gently, if you go uh, 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 uh. More gently go. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, uh. Now go. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. So I feel like the second one's a little lower in my throat, like just a tiny bit. Placement. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. And this is starting to. The thing is, is. Some of these things that we feel can be. Uh, relative. What I mean is, some things that I that I would have noticed more in the past, I notice less now because I take them a lot more for granted. Whereas somebody who's just learned, like I remember this for example, when I went to a singing lesson and uh, the teacher showed me like how to get into head voice, and I'd never really done it before, and she showed me this quality of like hoot, you know. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Now I don't even pull chest, so I don't even. Now, when I went to, on the hoot and I got through to my bridge and then I, I, after the lesson and for the next few days, I remember feeling this like uh, this feeling of like what we would call press or release or yawn or uh, what did we call it? Uh, what did you call it earlier? Not yawn. Cry. Cry. And I remember like, oh, my God, like I could feel it so clearly. I could feel it so clearly and I have this experience of this sensation I hadn't really experienced before. The issue is though, it, it's real clear for the first few weeks and as you work on it more and more and it becomes normalized, that that clear, that clear clarity in the sensation starts to drift away even though you're doing it still. Um, and because it's no longer new and it, when it's not new and it becomes something you do every day, it loses the shine basically. So I guess just to bring back to the point you're making, I guess what I'm trying to say is when we're explaining these sensations, when you discover these sensations, they can feel much more profound than when you've been doing them for ages. So sometimes it's hard to me for, to relate because some of you say, do you feel this? And I'll be like, well, I haven't really thought about that maybe for five years. Maybe I thought about it recently. Like I have thought about some things in the last year, technical things that I've worked on, but I haven't necessarily thought about other things that I now completely take for granted. And when it becomes habitual and automatic, when decent technique is automatic, you don't really think or notice it anymore. Not in anything like the way you do when you first discover these like silver bullet type things like release, you're like, oh my God, it's that. And then you like work on it for weeks and it feels unbelievably clear. It changes, um, even though you're still doing it because it becomes normalized. Um, I'm not, I'm kind of elaborating on a broader point there, but you, you think, you, I think you get what I mean. Yep. I have another kind of a question. Um, it would be really helpful if I had a sample of all the different scales, like from you, so I could listen to it, try and repeat it. Yeah. Have you thought of making a video with just well, like one really good example of each of the scales? You could probably sell that. Yeah, I, I, what I can do is like with I'll send you uh, I'll send you a bunch of stuff um, examples. Um, they're not mine, but they're good examples. Um, mm. Yeah, I have thought about making a program of some kind, but frankly, I think that Brett's programs are as good as they can be in terms of that type of program. So I normally refer people to those, um, mm. but I'll send you examples from those programs. Um, and then you have lots of examples of good scales, but you are right. I'll send you some links to some video lessons as well, because they helped me. And the thing is about learning technique is whilst when you're copying me in the lesson, that helps. Um, just hearing people outside of when you hearing other people execute good technique 
will help you a lot as well. So yeah, I'll send you some examples. You talked about <laughs> earlier about staying narrow. When you hear people doing scales, when they're just like, mum, 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 and there's absolutely no motion and it's art every time, like hearing that, you're like, oh, okay. Now I understand like most, a lot of it is realizing like, okay, it's not, it's not, it's not acceptable just to kind of be wishy-washy with a vowel. Like these guys who take it serious, like they are super, super disciplined with some of these things. And once we get that into our heads, we're like, okay, so I've got to make sure, absolutely sure that it's super, super disciplined for my technique to get better. Typically more disciplined than people realize when they start technique, because most of the technique that goes wrong is that people have these kind of wobbly boundaries that they're not really paying any attention to. And when we work at technique in the lesson, it's like we suck all of that in, we get it real as strict as we can. So you start to understand like, okay, the boundaries you have are not the boundaries these good singers have. Now the boundaries we can't see, we have to feel, but they're there, they're real. Yeah, I'm feeling that in some of the harder songs that I sing, like, uh, you know how when you go from through your bridge and your voice kind of flips, you, your voice goes to a different spot. I'm finding uh, I'm able to sort of stick in the one spot through the whole part of the song. Does that make sense? That's, that yeah. really, really helps. It that's like what, you got yeah. coordination over things. And that's what you want to be looking for is a sense that you don't feel a shift in compression as you as you go up into your bridge, you know, into your bridge area. Um, now, sometimes we make certain choices depending on what type of voice we have and what we're trying to sing, uh, what style we're singing. But we shouldn't feel like we're backed into a corner. You know, whenever I'm singing an F, F sharp, G, I've got to, uh, I've got to go into a lighter coordination. If we're having to do that, it means that we're not really fully understanding what we're doing yet. Uh, what is the difference between using a short scale or a long scale? And when when would I incorporate one versus the other? Well, you can think about short and long scales as, as different tools in the sense that the longer scale helps us zoom out to a more macro level understanding of what we're doing. And what I mean by that is, as we go through our range, the muscles contract and, and stretch the cords. So on a long scale, we get more motion with the muscle, a broader motion with the muscle. And that helps say to the brain like, ah, when I go high, this needs to happen. So it helps kind of zoom out and see a bigger picture. Whereas if I'm just doing like, you know, like a na 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 It's all well and good, but you know, I'm kind of just stuck here and the muscles are hardly moving. So if I don't know the broader context of that motion, it doesn't teach me much at first. Because most mm. singers, when they start with technique, like they could do that short scale, but as soon as they get to a certain point, they hit a brick wall because they don't know like this. They don't know this broader, deeper understanding of on a macro level, what does the voice need to do to get higher? So the longer scales help us zoom out and understand that more because the cricothyroid engages and stretches the cords much more through the whole scale. So we get a clearer signal to the brain like, ah, okay, this is what it feels like to go up and down on the voice. The short scales though, uh, the opposite. They help us focus on a mi on the micro level. They help us get into well. Why is it that when I get around this middle C, I feel like mum 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 mum? Why is it wobbling there? You know what is the issue? Now you might be able to execute the long scale fine, but often uh, I, I, when I say you, I just mean the singer. Often people who are uh, they're first able to do the longer scales. But then when you get into right into that mid range on the short scales, they'll either ma 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 or they'll ma 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 ma. You know, they'll they'll start to either loosen connection or the lance will creep up a little bit and they lose a bit of the balance. So the short scales help us get into the detail, like where is it that the technique is exactly slipping? Um, but they don't show us anything about the broader problem. Um, the long scales zoom out, but it's easier to skip those details on the long scales. So if you so see it like, both. yeah, if you see it like that, you can tailor an exercise or you can tailor your practice um, around that exercise. So let's say, let's say you can do the long scale, but it feels like it's a bit clunky in the mid range where you go shorten the scale down and like right drill into that mid range, find where's the problem. Or let's say you go through the mid range on the short scale and it just feels like you get to a ceiling. There's something more broadly wrong here. 
Well, you're not going to fix it typically on that short scale. You zoom back out, get over the bridge, zoom out, over the bridge, over the bridge, and then figure out, okay, maybe I come down from the top into that area so that I'm not pulling anymore. So, I mean, this is kind of getting into a deeper conversation about how I teach and what I'm thinking about as I teach in terms of fixing problems. But knowing this stuff helps because ultimately you've got to teach yourself this stuff. And I've only figured it out because I've taught loads of people and I've had so many issues with my own voice trying to get better at this that, you know, I can kind of break down some of these complicated issues. Um, but yeah, that that's really what there's, there are very, very key differences between a longer scale and shorter scale and, yeah. and why they're valuable. That makes sense. Um, when do you include more nasal or less and why? Like I remember you, when I, you were teaching me hootie, to be hootie last time, you said, don't you do any nasal. And I was wondering like why. Well, with you, I think from memory, um, you were kind of leaning in a direction as we got into a certain part of the range. Sometimes people will move from, from, from hoot to pharyngeal because they've got this sense of like, okay, I can get through my bridge easier if I kind of connect on this quality rather than that quality. So most of the time, it doesn't really matter if I'm going, if I understand what I'm doing, I can go, I can go, ah, or I can go, ooh. neither is right or wrong. But what we get with struggling singers often is I'll go, okay, we do this hoot, ooh, but they'll go, ooh. that's a problem because they aren't comfortable releasing on the hoot, so they move to another resonance. They move to a different type of sound. Got it. So that's the technical issue in terms of we've got to be able to be comfortable on different types of resonance through the bridge. So if we're on hoot, we stand hoot. If we're on pharyngeal, we stand pharyngeal. If we're on chest, we stand chest. Um, the other, the other part of it though, which is in terms of applying singing, and you know, would we lean towards nasal or mouth or hoot? Um, typically with most like popular singing nowadays, the only style I can think really that leans towards a bit more in terms of, um, the pharynx is, would be country, for example, you get a little bit of that, but even nowadays you get less of that than you used to. Um, outside of that, most po popular styles, you don't, you wouldn't really lean so much on, mm. you're going to pretty much be on either hoot or more of a mouthy kind of quality. And even when I say nay, 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 there is some uh in there, but it's typically not exaggerated. If I'm if I'm taking it too far, that's going to just take me too far off center in terms of applying this stuff. So when we apply singing, we've got to basically sit somewhere that's relatively tasteful is the best way I can explain it. It's not so much right or wrong. It's like, what's going to fit with the style? What will be appropriate? And am I taking it too far? Typically, the worst singers are singers that can have quite good technique, but they take certain things too far. So they lean too much into the pharynx or too much into that dark. Classical singers are really bad at this in terms of the ones I've seen that aren't so, so good is that they lean on that muddy quality we were talking about earlier and everything starts to become so muddy and dark that all of that brightness is just gone and all they're left with is this just mud, basically. Conversely, if it's too nasal all the time, that can be too piercing as well if it's like too much of that 3K. Um, so like you kind of got to, over time, get experience enough that you've kind of got A, confidence in where your balance is and B, that it's like, in the center enough that it's you know it's not going to be too too out there basically um but well, that starts very, to become a bit sub that starts to become a bit subjective at that point because you know some people will say bob dylan isn't a great singer um he leans more in the pharynx in a sense but uh he's actually technically pretty good in terms of what he was doing you wouldn't so much get young singers now singing like that so much um, mm -hmm. closest I've heard is that guy from the war, what's it called? Just get the, uh, 
I used to find Bob Dylan songs very hard to cover, and since the singing lessons, they've gotten a lot easier. He's actually not that easy to sing like. There's actually some things that he does really well. Um, if you listen to he gets really wide on some of those choruses that he sings, but he is totally in control, which is not particularly easy for people to do. Um, a lot of trained singers can't do that because they've learnt to um, narrow everything down to the point where they don't really get, they're not really comfortable staying wide anymore. Let me just search this. He gets real wide, but he stays, he stays narrow, as in stays in control. The War on Drugs. Yeah, that guy is quite a good singer and you can hear a lot of Bob Dylan influence, but you can hear it's a little bit more modern in the sense that it's not quite as pharyngeal as Bob was or is, I guess, I mean, you could see he's still alive. But um, so, yeah, it comes down to some of that subjective for sure. Because I've seen people with perfect technique and I see coaches being like, yeah, it's not very good. And I'm like, hmm. I think they're focusing on the style rather than the the actual technique. Um, try, I'll, if I think of some other examples, I'll let you know. Okay. Can I go over my routine with you? Yeah, yeah. Where where do you start with what? what how do you start? What scale? Well, at first, at first I do like a five to ten minute warm up with a bunch of like semi occluded phonations and lip trills and that kind of stuff. So mm, 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 and ah, mm, that kind of stuff just to get it going. And then I start with either I do the that, that scale that you usually do. So I start with either a uh or uh, and I do that one up the scale. So uh, 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 and then like on the next day, I'll do the uh and do that one. And then I go on to either goo 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 or gee gee gee. Do you do this uh and uh with a scoop? Like uh, 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 or would you just do yes. uh, 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 I do it the, the way, the first way you show yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could do it the second way, but it, I, at least from my experience, it's harder, that scale, than the, the one with the scoop. The scoop really helps to... um to to maintain the connection right the way through it helps a lot but you could uh there is i think on you can do the second one as a kind of that second one is basically a harder version of the first one so if the first one's super easy you can move to the second one as well so what are you going to say okay and then i feel if i do it right then i'll do it as a legato so the, ah like yeah that. if if it went right and i'll just immediately go to that and then the goo 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 or gee gee gee. And then, uh, so last time we met, you got me to do the hootie stuff because I was closing too hard. And that helped get rid of my sore throat a bit too. So that was good. So I, I do the, on a short scale, like just a one, three, five. I do the e, 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 or e, 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 or the next day I'll do ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, that scale's good view. I, I would flip that. I would start with, I would, before you do the squeaky door, I would go from the semi occluded exercises to this. That would be my, I do that as my first exercise. In fact, okay. I don't even do it on a scale. Like if I wake up at the moment, I just say, uh, I just start trying to thin out and stretch the chords from there. Um, and I just do it on a slide. And that sometimes, that, sometimes I get hardly any release when I wake up, but after five minutes, I find like, ah, okay, it's come back. Um, typically, but this depends on the singer because I found, so it might be the opposite for you, but Singers who over squeeze is, is more of their instinct. It's better for them to start gently and build in from less compression. Whereas singers that under squeeze is typically better for them to start with full closure. So 
it really depends where you're at with your balance because sometimes I found in the past I was an under squeezer and other times probably more so the majority of the time I was an over squeezer. So typically I will start on e, e, start on this quality and thin there. Um, but some days I can't get that easily because my voice isn't feeling great. So I'll need a little bit more connection to kind of get my voice a little bit more pliable and then I'll come back to that. But most days I will start on the light quality. But feel free to mix that up is all I'm saying. You might find that if you start gently and build into that, you get different results than if you start more connected and then back off of it. Um, if you're an over squeezer, it's better to start gentle. If you're an under squeezer, it's better to start fuller, typically. Got it. Yeah, when I uh, started doing that hoodie, I had a hard time the first couple of days and it got easier pretty quick and it, and it made a big difference. I thought my voice was getting worse there for a while and then I started doing that better and then things just went up another level. So it was really a really good tip. Well, this one here, mm -hmm. this one, because it's gentle on the closure, it's going to train your arytenoids to work very gently. And that gentleness, even though in we on the hoot, it's, it sounds light, that subtlety that you're developing on the gentle quality, it translates into other sounds. Because even if the chords are fully connecting, if those arytenoid muscles are able to make those small adjustments, you can go from that, because over squeeze isn't far from the full connection. So if you've got crude adjustment, it's easy to start over squeezing. Because if you worked on this finessing, it's training the arytenoids to work very subtly. So even when we do connect fully, we've got a better chance of not over squeezing. So all the coordinations help and feed into each other in a sense even though they're different, they have a broader quality that, that, that helps the other coordinations typically. Um, My next one I do is the no, no, no. So I'll go no, 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 or I'll go no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. And the next one I do is a vowel exercise I got from one of your YouTube videos. And I don't know if I'm doing it right. So I'll just start kind of here. I'm doing a E, A, A. And then the next day I'll do A, A, E. So basically I'm going to go E, A, And then just go all the way up the scale with that. Is that a good one? Yeah. The other one you want to do is U, O, A. E, A, A and U, O, A. Yeah. Ooh, oh, ah, that would be the other one. And Can I do yeah, that under, they sorry, need to be I, at I the do, end. Say that again, sorry. They need to be at the end because they're the hardest scales. Ah, okay. Yeah. And um, I do that scale, on medium short, closure. Yeah, very good. Short okay. scales, short scales without any consonants, especially if you're opening up vowels on a sustain. Those are some of the hardest scales you're going to learn. So you put those at the end of your workout, typically. Should I practice that on different levels of compression? Or just medium's good? Uh, you want to mix it up. Like I, I often do those quite gently because um, nowadays I don't have any problem like leaning into my mix at all. So as long as I get the position of the note, then uh, uh, as long as I get the position and the, the subtlety and the coordination, I know I can lean on it easily. But that, that wasn't so much always the case. Like I used to have to work on the coordinations more in the past. So like in the past, I would do it light, medium and heavy. And I would, I would tend to go days where I'd practice like more quietly. And then I'd have days where I'd practice with more volume and I'd kind of mix up. Nowadays, I just tend to get really detail in the motion of the muscles and then I just, I know it's going to work. So I don't really have to work on it in the same way I used to because it's really like the, it's the finesse of the motion of the muscles that's the hard part of singing really. Like mix isn't really that hard in a set, in the sense of like, once you know what you're doing, it's like, well, it's not really any different to anything else, isn't it? It's just, it's just a different way of doing it. 
Whereas the detail is, that takes time to develop. And even once you have it, it's kind of something that needs maintenance all the time, especially if you're sustaining and opening up valves in the mid range, because it requires so real high level of independence between the muscle groups. So, you know, it's like working on the perfect forehand in tennis or the perfect backhand. Like you've got this motion that you're repeating over and over. And if you're not doing it a lot, like it can kind of change. It can kind of get a bit crude. It can kind of get a bit clumsy. It's not going to be as sharp. Whereas even if you're, if you're going through that motion and hitting the tennis ball, you don't have to necessarily be hitting it at full whack. As long as you're repeating the motion, you can kind of trust that as you add more muscle fiber into that motion, you're going to get the extra power. Right. The motion is key, is what I'm saying, more so than the power. The power is really a result of the efficient motion of the muscles. And then the power feeds from that. Whereas a lot of people think, and I was guilty of this for many years, is that, you know, if I just, if I just clamp on it, that's where I get my f power. It kind of, in a sense, like we do have to hold on more and mix. But my experience is typically like as we get better, we realize oh, I don't have to hold on to it as hard as I thought I did. And again, I'm just keeping the vowel the same, same as the other, same as the other drills. Just making sure the vowel isn't changing. Well, yeah, I mean, that one's tough because you've got three vowels. If you're doing ua, ea, ya, are we still talking about that exercise? Yeah. So if you get to the e and the u properly, it's quite easy to open up typically because the u and the e are narrow. So when I have it's easy to, if we get to the ooh properly, it'll be fine. If you start to feel ooh, ooh, where it's not really ooh, that's when opening up will start to get harder. So we pay attention to that first vowel, it's critical. Um, but uh, that one's harder, to, in a sense, it's harder to monitor because you've got transition in the vowels. So you've got, you've got to kind of, at that point, start asking yourself, you know, am I opening up and maintaining balance? Because what happens as we open the mouth typically is, at first, we start to get into the bridge area, and it starts to change as we open up, and it can feel hard to, it can feel hard to open up there without, dropping out the mouth. So make sure ooh, oh, ah, ah, and it's not ooh, oh, uh, uh. It's gonna go uh when it's pulling, and ea, ah, is gonna go ea, ea, it's gonna go uh, ea, ea, uh, almost. Versus ea, ah, ah, ea, ah. It'd be a pure ah if I'm opening up correctly, and it would be a pure ah if I'm opening up correctly. Those wide vowels, bright vowels tend to go to er, uh, and the dark vowels tend to go to er. Uh. And when I say er, uh, I don't mean this r. Uh, I mean like ooh, oh, uh, e, a, uh. It it starts to go to this kind of kind of widespread er uh, yelling type of quality. It's hard to kind of demonstrate, but. Basically, it will, it will roughly, it won't go ooh, oh, ah, it will go ooh, oh, ah. It will go more like that when it's wide on the opening. And it will go e, a, a. So e, a, e, a, a, a. It won't go e, a, a. It won't go ah. So this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Like if we're thinking about how do we, how do we understand if a vowel is narrow or wide, or if it's, in control or out of control is another way of saying the same thing because a wide when it gets out of control that's really what we mean when we say not staying narrow anymore um when you get those contrasts between the vowels if you can keep it pure that gives you again that reference or that contrast ooh oh ah and ea ah is going to feel different to ooh oh uh, and ea uh, it's going to feel different to the pull um and right. that that comparison is what shows you what what's what's narrow versus what's not. Okay. My next one is the squeaky vowel. So yeah. I'm going to pick a different vowel each day and work on that. 
Yeah, what you mean the squeaky door? Like, I mean, you could approach that in different ways. That one's an easier exercise, so that one should certainly be the short scales opening up vowels. Definitely put at the end because they're the hardest you're going to do. This one you could do in various ways. You could do one day, uh, 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 uh. you could do the next day, ooh, 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 ooh. you could do the next day, ah, 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 ah. The ah is going to be the hardest because it's right in the middle. It can feel real wobbly that one. Um, the ooh is kind of at the end because it's dark and narrow, and the 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 uh, 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 is kind of bright and pharyngeal. It it's really easy to get into mix through that pharyngeal sound. So, um, but they're less balanced in terms of the center. Ah, 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 like that's right in the middle, really. You know, it's not ooh and it's not ah. It's not. It's neither overly dark or overly overly bright. Um, hence why. Is spoken about as the most neutral of the exercises because that that vowel is it doesn't lean in either direction. It's right in the center. It's not it's not bright. It's not dark. It's kind of in between. Um, That's actually my next one. The mum mum. Yep. I would go. I would think about this in terms of what you do. You want to weight the. The structure of the workout towards longer scales typically earlier in the workout, shorter scales, and as you get through the workout, oh, sorry, longer scales towards the start of the workout and less compression at the start of the workout. And oh, this is this is how I do it anyway. And then as you work through, you start adding more connection and you start shortening the scales and taking the consonants away. And so taking the, hard the away? Consonants away. Oh, the hardest okay. and sustaining more. So the hardest scales are sustain, short scales, sustain, no consonants. And the easiest scales are long scales, low compression, uh, like semi-occluded ones or ones where you've got like a consonant. But semi-occluded, long, light closure. <laughs> These are the easiest scales. The hardest is none. Uh, ooh, oh, 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 oh. These are the harder ones. Okay. So if you take those as your two end, start and end point, you move from light semi-occluded scales, long scales, towards shorter scales, towards more compression, towards less consonants, towards more sustain, towards transitioning between vowels without those consonants. Like that's the push towards from easy to hard. That's basically the direction of what's an easy scale and what's a hard scale. That's really how you've got to think of it because the harder those scales get, you're going to find more problems. Yeah, like if I, even if I'm doing this scale now, like I'm like, ugh, if I'm just diving into that scale, it's like, ugh, do I really want to do that? Like I can feel mentally there's more resistance there. Because it's like throw it throws me in at the deep end. Right. That, I mean that's harder than singing that scale. Um, keep keep it in mind. Whereas if I start on and then this is like there's so much help that you can just find your voice so quickly. Um, so yeah, that's that's the like broad scope of like how you want to think about a workout. So you need to just reorder those a little bit and and think about how do I transition from what's easiest and what I'm, what I'm going to achieve quickly to what's harder and what's going to take more time. So I used to find I would think, okay, I'm going to do this. And I would get to a point in the practice where I would have trouble and I might end up spending half an hour right just there, wherever it was. And I wouldn't even necessarily get to some of the harder exercises. But when I started, I used to just drill through the exercises and just do them all and not really think about them so much. But if you notice, often in the in the lessons, though, we've kind of just basically chatted this whole hour. That's okay. It's gone very quickly. Um, in the lessons, we tend to drill down on just one or two scales sometimes, maybe three, three scales. Like we don't necessarily go at such a high pace as people typically do when they practice. Now, there's a reason for that is because a lot of the time when we just run scales, 
especially when we're starting learning this, we don't really notice or understand like when things are going wrong very well. So sometimes I used to do workouts where I'd do less, basically, again, a bit like micro macro, you can think of this, you could do like, a, you could do like 40 minutes where you do lots of scales more quickly and you just kind of go through and you kind of focus on speed and just just see what happens like momentum like just go 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 which is needed for singing and then other days hone in okay i'm just going to do like i'm going to just do light coordinations today i'm just going to work on i'm going to go like a and then and then do the opening up but on lighter coordinations and then another day I would work more focused on like medium compression or heavier compression the thing is this stuff gets boring if you get more serious about it and what I mean by that is when you're doing it every day you have to find ways to make it interesting because if you just run the same scales every day eventually you just drive you insane so uh, when we say keep it interesting the way we do that is I used to just mix it up some days I would just sing no scales at all. Other days I would do mostly scales. Other days, you know, and I mix up well, what what scales I'm going to do today. How many, what what type of coordinations I'm going to focus on. When we you can break it up like that more, it gives you a sense of like coming at different problems each day rather than just the same thing day in day out. Um, mm -hmm. So you can weight the practice differently between like scales and application. You can you can focus in on different parts of the coordinations for the, for each day or you can focus on like um now for some for me i had to focus a lot on just doing the scales without any pausing like totally committed to the scale like that can be another focus as well but um as in you know just go 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 no stopping um because sometimes when you get into the details it can get a bit slowed down to the point where not there's not enough you know it's too hesitant at that point so point being is you've got to find ways to mix it up so you uh you don't want to necessarily be always doing that routine every day yeah okay. and then another one i've been doing i think i might have made this one up myself but if i go like in my speech range and i just pick a vowel so i go ah, and i just start with uh like a little bit of compression then and, and medium and then a lot and then try to do this with it and when my speech range, it feels like I can just do this as easy as my hands are doing it. And then I go up to the middle C area where it's a lot harder and I try to repeat the exact same thing and just sort of move in those chords around, practice getting them uh, to closing and just doing that. Is that a good drill too? Yeah, and it is harder for people as we go up hard. Once we've got the cricothyroid engagement, we've got two balls to juggle at the same time. So in chest, it's typically easy for people to go like, ee. Uh, like a wee 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 na 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 ba 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 you know kind of lean into some grip once we've got the cricothyroid engaging I'm having to do something to get to that note from there it could be harder at first because what people find is get, get maintain, holding that release in place whilst they adjust the closure is a different thing to just adjusting the closure which is all we're doing down low so down mm -hmm. low, the cricothyroid is just sat there doing nothing. So it's very right. easy to adjust the closure. As soon as we go up higher, we've got two muscle groups working at the same time. One of them needs to be very still, whilst the other one's adjusting. And that's ultimately why singing is hard, because right. we've got to have the independence between the muscle groups. We'd ha we don't need that so much down low in chest, because the cricothyroid is doing nothing to stretch the cords. So it is higher, harder. That being said... I would say it's harder in the mid range than it is in head because once we've got enough of that head voice engagement, it, the, the, the sensation in the cricothyroid is strong enough that it's easier to kind of keep in place. Think of it like this. If I'm picking up something heavy, you know, it's really obvious. Whereas in the mid range, it can be real tough because the, the muscles that stretch your cords are working very subtly and gently. So unless you've got a lot of confidence and a lot of understanding in terms of that detail, you hold that cricothyroid very gently in the mid-range. 
na 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 na. Hold it there and sustain it. E na 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 ba ba ba. And lean on it. That could be real tricky at first because there's so much subtlety in the in the adjustment of the muscles in the mid range. That's why singing in the mid range is harder than up high for most people. It took me a lot longer to learn it. I've only really started to get better at it in the last couple of years. And in the last six months, I'd say I started to kind of more feel like I was mastering it. But um, I certainly was singing in head voice for many years before I felt like I even got into the mid range. That's kind of my failing as a learning singer is I kind of learned it backwards. I should have learned it the other way around. But, you know, I uh, I kind of went all in and uh, learned it in reverse. Cool. Hey, that was a good lesson, man. Thanks. Yeah. I think fleshing out these ideas is key um, and um, asking questions like this is it starts to get a little bit into the nuts and bolts of some of these things because I do think that running scales whilst it shows you exactly what you need to be doing um, the value in breaking down some of the details in these, these ideas is that it creates a kind of framework for you in terms of how is the best way to look at these problems? One of my main issues with vocal technique as a whole is just that there is a lot of baggage from from all the stuff that came before that just gets carted along and not even ever thought about, just taken for granted. Because I came into this as an adult, a lot of the ways I explain this are are not necessarily as traditional. But I feel like that they make understanding it clearer and more. It, it it makes it seem more obvious to me when I explain it. I'm like, well, we're just doing that. You could explain it in a way that's more traditional. And typically it's more vague and it's less direct. Whereas the language I use is typically more direct and less vague. Um, and that's typically that 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 tradition is from Seth Riggs and then Brett Manning. I'm just a continuation of that tradition of functional voice coaching, of directly explaining what am I doing rather than saying just support or you yeah, know, o yeah. open your throat or put the sound in the mask. All of those, all of that stuff is baggage from the past that is not direct. It doesn't really say anything when you think about it and it could be interpreted in many, many ways. Whilst language is a bad tool to explain singing, some language is worse than 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 other other language let's say <laughs> so um some of the ways i explain it, i think are like in the newer tradition of being a lot more direct with this and just like getting rid of all the clutter and just saying like what am i doing here just to explain it because if i'm talking to you about guitar you know with the fretboard and stuff and someone says what are you doing with your hands like you know we can just show you well i'm moving my fingers delicately yeah stop doing this and that's all I'm saying when people, you know, we talk about crude adjustment of the vocal folds. Bad singers do this with their vocal folds. Right. Yeah. Good, good singers do this. Nice, subtle motions with, with, uh, with precision. And when we talk about, I'm just talking about that. The only difference is you can't see your vocal cords because they're stuck in your throat. But if you could see them, if, if, if everything was transparent and you could just see in, I could literally just hold your vocal. I could just say, okay, Put your vocal cords that way there, you know, if, if we mm -hmm. could do that. But they're too small and they're too hidden. So it puts this this unfortunate situation where it leaves a lot of a lot of opportunity for um, ambiguity that shouldn't really be there, if I, in my opinion. So.